And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that uh, we could see you enthroned um, on the tree, on the Ark of the Covenant, on the judgment seat of the living God. And now, Lord, I pray that you would cause us to preach so we would see you in your word. And Father, uh, this is a message that could be easily misunderstood, could also be easily misspoken. So Lord Jesus, I ask for your spirit uh, to mediate you, the word, to us. Amen. It was December of 1978 when, thanks to Alan Parsons, I don't know if Alan's here this morning, thanks to Alan, I got up the courage to ask Susan Coleman out on a date. And then we went on thousands of dates, movies, dinners, hikes, picnics, you name it. It's hard to describe how enamored I was with her and how utterly thrilled I was when it seemed that she was also interested, even attracted, to me. At first, for me, it was all about her outrageous, I mean, it's hard to even describe, but her outrageous extreme 17-year-old hotness. But over the next five and a half years, she became my best friend, and I fell in love with her heart. I couldn't keep her hand, my hands off of her, and she couldn't keep her hands off of me. But we waited until the night of May 28, 1983, to consummate our marriage. We, we waited, but we definitely did, did not wait to kiss. And then kiss and kiss and kiss again and kiss at the Red Rocks, kiss in movie theaters, in front of the TV for hours and hours and, and hours. About 500 people attended our wedding. My dad officiated. They all listened as I gave everything I have and everything I am to Susan. That night, we honeymooned at the Christiana Lodge in Vail, and it was epic. In the morning, we went down to breakfast, and we sat in this little romantic corner all alone, and my bride said to me, Peter, there's something I need to ask you. That surprised me, but I said, well, ask away, sweetheart. You can ask me anything. She said, um, you're mine, right? And I said, well, yeah, I, I am yours. She said, you're mine, the ring is mine, everything you have is mine, right? And I said, well, yes. Wonderful, she said. So, um, so this is my question. Do I still have to kiss you? I mean, do I have to go and be like, intimate with you? Do we have to go on more of those dates and hang out? And do I have to act like I'm nuts about you? Do, do I have to kiss you since everything you have is mine already? Do I have to love you? And it was then that I realized she never did. And I realized that if I said, yes, you do have to love me, she never would. So all I could say is, no, you don't have to love me. For only then was it possible that she could. Only then could that harlot become the bride. Well, of course, that last part, the whole conversation, everything didn't happen. If it had, my heart would have been broken in two and nothing would have been able to ever stop the bleeding. It never happened and yet, of course, it does happen all the time. Not to me, 
but to Jesus. Sometimes people who call themselves Christians will say something like this to me. Well, Peter, if it's true that as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive, if, as you say, all things are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's, if Jesus thoroughly is successful at seeking and saving the lost, which he said he came to do, and all are called to the great banquet and all is forgiven and it is finished, if that's true, why would I be good? Why would I pray? Why would I go to church? Why would I love God if I don't have to love God? And it's then that I quietly think, I don't think this person knows God. Perhaps knows a little bit about God, but doesn't know God. They've obviously never actually been to church, maybe church buildings. I doubt they've ever actually prayed to God, and how could they be good when they don't even know who he is? And then if they say to me, so, okay, tell me then, tell me. Tell me, Peter. Tell me, pastor, do I have to get baptized? Do I have to take communion? Do I have to obey the law? Do I have to love God? What am I supposed to say? If I say, yes, you have to love God, it's the law, will they love God? Could they love God? And if I say, no, you don't have to love God, Wouldn't I simply be saying what is absolutely obvious, painfully obvious in this world? A whole lot of folks, even a whole lot of me, doesn't love God, so obviously we don't have to love God, at least not in in this world. And yet Paul is going to tell us, and of course Jesus has already told us, you will love God and you will love your neighbor as yourself. But how's that going to happen? not by works of the law. You will love, see that's more than a law, that's a prophecy. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Well in Romans 9.18, you remember if you were here last Sunday, we learned that God has free will. So then, writes Paul, he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. If Paul is right and God, beside whom there is no other, who is I am that I am, the creator of all things, including your will, if God has free will, then no one else could have a truly free will unless maybe God himself freely wills to give his will to them. Then Romans 9.18, that's Romans 19, then Romans 9.22 we read, Paul wrote, what if, what if, just what if, God willed to endure vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand. A vessel of mercy is a vessel of chesed, chesed in Hebrew, which means something like free love, relentless love, translated steadfast love, faithful love, or covenant love. God is love, And God has free will. God is the one who loves in freedom, to quote Karl Barth. If a vessel of wrath is a vessel filled with free love, or a vessel of mercy, I'm sorry, if a vessel of mercy is a vessel filled with free love, then perhaps a vessel of wrath is a vessel devoid of free love. Harlotry is an attempt to buy and sell love. That's not free love. And Hosea was commanded to marry a harlot. Two verses later, Romans 9, 25. As indeed God says in Hosea, those who are not my people I will call my people, and her who is not beloved I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, sounds like a vessel of wrath, there they will be called sons of the living God. That, that must be a vessel of wrath filled with mercy. <laughs> which is free love. As we mentioned last week, Hosea was commanded to take to himself, quote, a wife, a wife, a wife, a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom for the land of Israel commits whoredom. Hosea chapter one, verse two. 
Imagine how that felt for Hosea. He's commanded by God to take a harlot to himself and to love her. But a thousand times in a thousand ways, she must have said to Hosea, but now that I got the ring, Hosea, now that all that you have is what I have, it's mine, do I have to kiss you? Do, do, do I have to be intimate with you? Do I have to? What's in it for, for me? See, that's what ha- harlotry is. It's transactional love, which isn't love because it isn't free. Actually, the love has been like crucified. The prostitute doesn't love the man. She loved the man's money. And most men don't love prostitutes, and if they do, they usually cannot have the prostitute's heart. They can only have her body, and that for only a time and for a fee. But Hosea is commanded to marry and love Gomer because God has married and does love Israel, his people Israel. So when Gomer says, do I have to love you, What is Hosea supposed to do? Well, Hosea sets her free. Not free to love. Not free to choose the good. For she doesn't even know what love is and who the good is. She's free to what? To sell herself to another man. She's free to sin. Which is bondage. And she does. But then Hosea is commanded to buy her back because God's going to buy Israel back. God says that he will bring Israel, he'll bring her into the wilderness and romance her. In the valley of trouble, valley of Achor, he will make a door of hope. And there she will call him my husband and Israel will, quote, know the Lord. Hosea ends with one of Paul's favorite statements, favorite quotations, Hosea 13, 15, I shall ransom them from the power of hell, Sheol in in Hebrew, sometimes translated hell. I shall redeem them from death. O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Next verse, Romans 9, 27, and Isaiah cries out. Paul writes, and, because what Isaiah cries out is exactly what he thinks Hosea must have cried out. Right after God tells Hosea that his children are to be named no mercy and not my people, and that they represent um, Israel and Judah, Hosea 1.10, God says, yet Israel will be as the sand of the sea. And right after God informs Isaiah that he's going to, remember Isaiah 6, preach Israel, um, down to a remnant and then down to a stump that turns out to be one seed. God says, Isaiah 10, 22, though Israel be as the sand of the sea. It's like God is taunting them with hope so that Hosea and Isaiah would cry out, what about your promise to Abraham that his seed would be as the sand of the sea? If they're all vessels of wrath, how are you gonna make any vessels of mercy? Romans 9, 26, and in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, literally sperma, literally sperm, or more literally a sperm, because it's singular, or more literally the sperm, according to Paul in Galatians, the sperm is the indestructible holy seed, like the free will of God wrapped in a little bundle of flesh named Jesus. If God had not left us the seed, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? I guess this is what we will say that Gentiles, you know, heathen scumbags, who did not pursue righteousness, have attained it. That is a righteousness that is of faith, but that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. And now Paul is not just talking about the man 
Israel, but the people of Israel that was once a nation named Israel, but was the institution of Israel in Paul's day. It was literally his church. The word translated as church in English is the Greek word ekklesia, which is also translated assembly. So in the Greek version, the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the assembly of Israel is the ecclesia of Israel, the, the church of Israel. And even in the New Testament, Acts 7, 38, Israel is referred to as the church. Although modern translations usually translated as the, the assembly or, or the congregation, which leads to all sorts of theological confusion and possibly even World War III. <laughs> but, but for right now, I hope you can just see Paul's anguish. Why? Because he had been a prince in his institutional church. And then having encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, he had come to realize that Jesus the, was the Christ and was truly the fulfillment of all the hopes and dreams of his people Israel. But when he preached Christ in his church and explained how this was all biblically true, he had been met with like violent ridicule and wrath. And yet that wasn't foreign to Paul because he had been his church. And it certainly was not foreign to Jesus. He came to his own people, and his own people received him not. They had talked about him for a thousand years, over a thousand years, and then when he showed up, they didn't know him. And knowing him is life. It's eternal life. People sometimes say, well, you know, Peter, Jesus... He warned about hell more than anybody else in all the Bible. And that's true. If you define hell as Hades, Sheol, or, or Gehenna, the words that get translated hell, do you know Paul never even mentions the word? Never. But he's preaching to, to Gentiles, the unchurched. Jesus is the only one who directly warns people about hell. It happens 18 times as I count it, and every time he's warning his church, <laughs> Israel. He even says, on that day many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. A few verses later, Jesus marvels at, get this, you have to understand this historically, the faith of a Roman centurion. I mean, they're like actively oppressing the people of Israel, hanging them on trees on the side of the road. Uh, he, he marvels at the faith of a of Roman centurion saying, with no one in Israel, my church, have I found such faith. Next verse, he says to those that were following, many will come from east and west, recline a table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, while sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness where men weep and gnash their teeth. He didn't know them, and yet he knew they were sons of the kingdom. What does Jesus not know? He does not know what does not actually exist. And that's the self that you think you have created, the vessel of wrath. And what does he know? The selves that he has created. And, and who's that? Well, that's the sons, the daughters of God our Father. The vessel of wrath must be destroyed in order to liberate the vessel of mercy that is a son or a daughter, otherwise, They'll never want to join their father's party. We see this troubled Paul, this whole setup. And I mean, hasn't it kind of troubled you? I mean, haven't, honestly, haven't you ever wondered, how can Christians look so little like Christ and non-Christians sometimes look so much like Christ? How can church folks love so little, and some heathens seem to love so much, and not only look like Jesus, act like Jesus, and even think like Jesus. I've always been amazed at these stories I hear from the mission field. You know, Andrew, Andrew Trawick, he has this great story of going to this village in Mozambique where a guy took him out to meet this old man, elder of the village, out in a field. And uh, this old man, he, he said to Andrew, he said, I have always thought that, number one, there must be a creator and that he is good. 
And number two, because he made us the way he did, he must want us to know him. But number three, how could I approach him who is good when I have done evil? And then he said to Andrew, all my life, no one has ever been able to answer me this. You see, he already knew. Better than most of us know. And Andrew had the wonderful privilege of just sharing with him the name. Let me tell you about Jesus. My old friend George Husnick would share stories about entire Muslim villages having this same dream on the same night, all about Jesus, and then all putting their trust in Jesus in the morning. A few months ago, I shared how Billy Graham um, and that Buddhist monk wept tears of joy. Remember, I shared that story? When Billy Graham gave him a Bible, and uh, the, then, then the monk said, I've always known this this man. And as you were speaking, I heard him saying, that's my name, that's my name, that's my name. Nancy Cohn tells this uh, wonderful story about preaching to some remote tribe in some remote jungle where they had never even met a Westerner when this old man in a loincloth, he just started dancing wildly around the edge of the crowd. Worried, she prayed something like this, Lord, what's up with this guy? And she heard the Lord say something like, he's my friend. And he's glad you're talking about me. Incredulously, she then said, he knows you? And she heard the Lord say, yes. He knows me better than you. (laughs) Hopefully you realize that these ideas and stories aren't unbiblical. In fact, they're profoundly biblical. Abraham actually tithed to the priest king of Salem named Melchizedek, which means king of righteousness, who, who, who also gave Abraham communion, bread and wine. And this was thousands of years before there was anyone that you could call a Christian, and hundreds of years before there was anyone that you could call a Jew. But you see, it's not just a weird story from the Bible and the mission field. You know, I used to worry about Susan, because she didn't grow up in church. She was kind of a heathen. She never read her Bible. And then I began to realize that God was literally quoting Bible verses to her in her heart, verses she did not know. I mean, it was freaky, and in my mind, it's cheating. How could she know so much more about God than me, who had been to seminary? (laughs) I recently read one of Eckhart Tolle's books, and thought, how could this book be so profoundly Christian? He sounds just like Jesus. I'll watch movies and TV and think they're talking about Jesus. Probably don't know they're talking about Jesus, but they obviously love Jesus, and yet they never set foot in a church, probably because the church is boycotting their movies and the people in the church don't remind them very much of Jesus. And check this out. This shock is not just that Israel doesn't hear and the church doesn't hear. Sometimes it seems as if God is actively destroying both. In fact, it was just about 15 years after Paul sent the letter to the Romans that the empire of Rome destroyed the temple, which was a visible manifestation of Israel and the church, and then sent the Jews into exile once again while they obliterated Jerusalem. And it's not simply that it happened, but that Jesus said it would happen, and in some crazy way, he was responsible And of of course he was, because as Paul's been teaching us, he is the free will of God. He's responsible for everything. And now I need to say that I think I'm supposed to talk about something of which I have not wanted to talk for fear that I would sound like I'm justifying my failures. And, And maybe I am. Eighteen and a half years ago, my friend Faith, who was a counselor and was part of my congregation at the time, had an extended prophetic dream about me. I think she actually had one every year for three years on the same date until our church blew up. And I need to say it's important not not to believe every weird thing that someone tells you about God. But I trusted faith, and so I have pondered these words now for almost 19 years. At the time, our church, Lookout Mountain Community Church, 
had just moved into this amazing new facility on the side of Interstate 70. Church attendance had gone from something like 1,300 to well over 3,000 on Christmas and, and New Year, or Christmas and Easter. And, and I need to say this, it was a great church. Wonderful programs, great people. I was preaching many of the same sermons that I still preach here today. I, I think we were supposed to build the building, and at the time I was thinking, it's, it's, we're set, we're ready for a reformation. I mean, books and agents, and we're set for a reformation to the glory of God's grace in Christ Jesus. And faith had this dream that I'll now abbreviate tremendously. In the dream, I'm talking with friends at a train station when a man in a mother of pearl suit approaches. He must be Jesus in his body, the true church, the pearl. But he bought a ticket and asked me to leave my friends and join him on the train. I think it may have been a train of thought and then the scene changed, and Faith saw us standing on the desert floor with thousands of people gathered around expectantly waiting. In the distance on a, a cliff, uh, in the distance, old Jerusalem appeared, shimmering in the sun, and everybody could tell exactly what it was. And then to its left, Lookout Mountain, Mountain Community Church also appeared, and then black balls started falling from the heavens, and they began to destroy old Jerusalem, and then they destroyed, uh, began to destroy Lookout Mountain Community Church, and then they began to fall upon the plain. And she said people could see them coming and just easily step aside. But she said, Peter, you saw one coming, and you wouldn't move. Some men picked up my dead body, but not my physically dead body, said, said Faith, or wrote Faith. And, and they carried it up the cliff, and then she wrote this. Old Jerusalem is crumbling. LMCC, the LMCC church building is crumbling. But the hearts of the people, the church is not. The man in the white luminous suit is there, showing his delight in all that is unfolding. I think some of you were some of those that carried my, my body. Three years after that dream, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church told me that all I had to do was publicly confess that there was a group of people that could not be saved and that God did not want to save. For if I did that, I could then remain a pastor in good standing with my fellow pastors standing back at the train station. I would suppose. I did see it coming, but I didn't move because I couldn't move, because for me it would have been to deny Yahweh his salvation. And I was literally blackballed. <laughs> and yet, the black balls fell from heaven. So who's to blame? The man in the mother of pearl suit, pearl suit I, I, I guess, I guess. We started the sanctuary 30 miles from the old location and many thought we'd become an even more mega, mega church. I, I believe that God really wanted us to do this thing called the sanctuary, but before long, three different people approached me and they all said the same thing. Peter, I was praying and God wants you to know this will get small <laughs> before it gets big. I hated that. And I have often wondered and prayed, God, how small? And if it ever does get big, will I see it? Then on several occasions, my wife came to me and said, and I quote, Peter, Jesus wants you to know that you cannot build the sanctuary. How's that for encouragement? I remember as a child at some revival meeting, the preacher was quoting God in Isaiah 6. Remember the verse we've been talking about burning coal on the lips the whole nine yard, and, and, and he quoted the line, whom will I send? And I distinctly remember praying, I wanna be a geologist, but 
you can send me. I wasn't aware at the time that God was calling Isaiah to preach Israel down to a remnant and then a stump that was only one seed, one promised seed. Around that time, another friend said, Peter, the Lord wants you to know that for now the sanctuary is to only be about worship. At first I thought maybe that meant singing, but now I believe he was talking about focus. No bells and whistles, no um, amazing, outstanding programs, just focus on me. What I show you about me, Jesus, the promised seed. And don't misunderstand, God has done some amazing things through the sanctuary. I mean, conferences, videos, websites, but they weren't me. And every time I've come up with a plan, it's literally crumbled in my hands. 13 years ago at a conference in Michigan, sitting next to Susan and listening to the leader, this is what she was talking about, how, about Moses and how God humbled him before he had him lead people out of Egypt into the desert. I remember as I was listening to this, I was just angry. You could call it wrath. I was angry at God. When Susan grabbed a piece of paper and she just started writing, she was dictating. This doesn't happen to me, but it happens to her. She was getting words from the Lord. This is what she wrote. I have it framed on this piece of paper and I I keep it on the shelf in my office, September 28, 2008. Peter, you are my heart. And then there's like a parenthesis or a blank space, where she said this part was where it wasn't very clear to me, but I think you're supposed to fill in a name with whoever you felt slandered or or hurt. So, uh, Peter, you are my heart. They cannot take away from you who you are who I have made you. See, I think that's what we were preaching on last week. They cannot take away who it is that God has made me. That's the vessel of mercy. But they can take away who it is that I have made myself, my false self, my old man, my ego, the vessel of wrath. Well, anyway, she continued writing. They cannot take away from you who you are, who I have made you, Now that you know who you are, I'm calling you to walk in freedom, to free people, to be who you are supposed to be. Totally stripped of all, God has been allowed to clothe you. I will show you the way to go, my heart. As your pastor, I'm embarrassed to read that to you because I so often feel like I don't know which way to go. And I so often do not feel free, but I'm supposed to free you. I think this must mean help for you from yourself, as we've been preaching on, your body of sin and death. But it's not only yourself, maybe it's our self, our old self. Seriously, so many times I've prayed, Jesus, I'm supposed to free people? From what? And then I have sarcastically prayed, well, I am freeing them from church. And in recent years, I've wondered if he started answering in my heart, yes, exactly. I asked Susan to pray with me on Thursday. She didn't know what I was preaching on, thinking, or the title of the sermon. I prayed, Jesus, I think maybe you want me to talk about that thing I'm so embarrassed to talk about, amen. And then Susan said, I just heard the Lord say, I want you to set my people free. So listen up. You don't have to go to church. And now let me preach to myself. Got my wife's makeup mirror. Peter Hyatt, you do not have to go to church. You know, um, 
when my kids were little, we'd make them do chores. Kiss their grandma, eat dinner with us, give us gifts on the holidays. But there came a day with each of my kids that I had to find a way to say something like this. No, John, you don't have to get me a Father's Day present. No, Elizabeth, you don't have to come home to eat dinner with us. No, Becky, you you don't have to kiss me if you don't want to. No, Coleman, you don't have to mow the lawn. But you know, I had such a great Father's Day last Sunday. It was busy, I had to preach had to do a funeral, but, but my kids each found ways to give me gifts or a call. Elizabeth like threw this little party for me in the 15 minutes I have between one thing and another. And at the end of the day, I thought, this is the best Father's Day I've ever had. Not because of the gifts, but because what I've always wanted is for my kids to want me. And that's what I got. So, why don't we have to go to church? Well, it's so that we could want to go to church. And now let me clarify, church is not a building, it's not a bunch of programs or a system of government, a sermon, a band, a prayer meeting. Church is not a 501c3 nonprofit organization registered with the state of Colorado called the Sanctuary Denver. That might be around for a few more months, might be around for a few hundred years. And it doesn't really matter because it's not the church. The church is the ecclesia, which is at least two or three people called together in worship, even over the internet, and you can only worship if you want to worship. And when we actually worship, and it can take a million different forms, when we actually worship, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the Revelation, John hears a new creation, and it's every creature in heaven and earth and earth and sea and all that is within them, worshiping the one on the throne. So I could say it all this way. You don't have to go to church so that you would want to go to church, and you don't have to go to heaven so that you would want to go to heaven. No one can go to heaven unless they want to go to heaven, and if you don't want to go to heaven, heaven will burn like hell. And yet if you hear this as a threat, you will never want to go to heaven. And if you think of heaven as anything other than Jesus, you don't even know what it is. In just a few chapters, Paul's going to write this. We must all stand before the judgment seat of God, which he also calls the judgment seat of Christ. And so you see, I think this is the judgment. You will see the heart of God displayed in Jesus Christ our Lord, there on the throne, standing on the throne, and he will ask you something like this. Do you want me? Do you like me? And all sorts of strange people will say, oh my gosh, I have loved you all my life. And I didn't know your name. (laughs) So yes, 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 Jesus, Jesus, I, I want you. Yahweh is self, I want you. And some who knew his name may say something like this. My pastor said that you'd be different the second time around. And you're not. And so, um, no, I don't think I like you. Paul told Timothy that the crown of righteousness is for all who, quote, have loved his appearing. He, his appearing. He, he doesn't change the second time around. The judgment is Jesus. Do you love me? Do you want me? Do you trust me, to put it in theological lingo? Do you have faith? For thousands of years, the institutional church has come up with things you can do in order, things you can do in order to get 
faith. And foremost among those things is usually something like this. Well, go to church and do what we tell you to do. For if you do these things, you'll go to heaven because (laughs) God loves you. And if you don't do these things, you'll be endlessly tortured in hell because you don't love God, and so he doesn't love you. But that doesn't make you want God. It makes you secretly hate God while pretending to love God. It makes you self-righteous and turns you into a hypocrite. And so like the Pharisees, we don't make believers when we do that. We make those that are, quote, twice the children of hell, Gehenna, to use Jesus' words, as we ourselves. And so maybe you see it's not such a bad thing that right now in the United States of America where the church has exercised so much power and control like all the other principalities and powers of this world, maybe it's not such a bad thing that the institutional church is crumbling. Maybe God is saying, y'all don't have to go to church. And you never actually could go to church as long as you thought you had to go to church. I'm calling you to be the church. And you cannot be the church if you don't want to be the church, my beloved. So how do we want what God wants? How do we love God in freedom the way he loves us in freedom? How do we fall in love with God? How do we get faith? Romans 9.30, what shall we say then, writes Paul? Well, that the Gentiles, the unchurched and non-Christians who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is out of, from, of faith, but that Israel who pursued a law, and remember the law is what? It's the knowledge of good and evil taken from a tree in order to make yourself in the image of God to make yourself right. That Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching the law. Why? Because they did not pursue it from faith. And we're asking the question, well, how do I get it? Because they did not pursue it from faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. In just those little verses, Paul pulls together all these Old Testament pictures and identifies the stone. It's it's Jesus. Remember in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, he dreams dreams of a stone. Nebuchadnezzar does. Daniel interprets a dream. A stone cut by no human hands. It falls from the heavens like a black ball from one of faith's dreams. And what does it do? It shatters all the kingdoms of this world and then it grows. Or things grow on it, however that works, into a kingdom that fills the whole earth. In Isaiah, Isaiah calls the stone a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling. The name Jesus means God is salvation. And you need to realize there's no greater stumbling stone than that for the religious spirit. No greater stumbling stone than than that. No greater offense to the human ego than that rock of offense. Because God is salvation, it means that you are not your own salvation. Jesus is literally the death of Mises. David writes that the stone the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. Israel rejected Jesus, the temple was destroyed, and then the temple is rebuilt by God upon Jesus. When we build to obtain Jesus, salvation, Yahweh is salvation, we build the Tower of Babel. We build an institutional vessel of wrath, the whore of Babylon. But when God builds upon salvation, upon Jesus, and we still have to talk about how Jesus gets into us, but when he builds upon Jesus, the new Jerusalem comes down and the living, breathing body of Christ rises from the dead, the vessel of mercy, his body and his bride. Jesus is a stumbling stone and cornerstone is also the foundation stone, not only of the temple on Mount Zion, but of all creation for all time. Jesus is the word of I am that I am. You cannot exist in the manifest presence of your creator if at the same time you believe you are your own creation. 
which is exactly what the human ego believes, which is exactly what a vessel of wrath believes, which is exactly what self-righteousness is. Next verse. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, my church Israel, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Isn't that crazy? No one in all the world knew as much about God as Israel. Paul just told us, remember chapter 9, verse 4, to them belongs the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. They got all his stuff. No one knows as much about God as the church, but that doesn't mean that the church knows God. No one knows as much about Peter Hyatt as Kaiser Permanente, the CIA, and Google. I mean, they got my blood record, my medical records, all my blood work, police records, spending records, every email I've ever written. They know all about me, and none of them know me. Not like my bride. Hallelujah. Verse 3, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God, what is the righteousness of God? In seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness, for Christ is the telos. Translated end, but also translated uh, perfection or completion. He's, he's, he's the, the, the tell us the fulfillment of the law. That, that must be why Jesus lifted his head on the cross and said, to tell us die, from, from tell us it is finished. The, the law is fulfilled. Humanity will love in the image of God. Christ is the end of, of law, not just the law. The article is missing in the Greek. Paul didn't include the article the because he's not just talking about the Mosaic law. He's talking about all knowledge of good and evil, taken, dispensed, marketed, and used to make ourselves in the image of God, to make ourselves right, to justify ourselves. Christ is the end of law to make ourselves right, for righteousness to everyone who literally uh, to, all, to all the trusting, to all who, who believe, to, to all those who trust. And now we're back at this tree in the garden, in the sanctuary of our soul, asking the question, where does trust come from? And who is that man on the tree? <laughs> That's our helper, our husband. That's the righteousness of God. So how do we make ourselves righteous? We don't. And when we try, we take the life of the righteousness of God. <laughs> We crucify the righteousness of God. Just like Israel crucified the Christ in order to be the Christ. Just like Gomer the harlot crucified the heart of Hosea. And just like Susan would have crucified me if she would have asked me, do I still have to kiss you? What do I have to do, Peter, in order to get your stuff? How can I use you so I'm not dependent on you and don't have to be with you, but you know, like can take your place? We don't make ourselves righteous, but God will make us righteous with himself when we submit to God's righteousness, who is Jesus, our bridegroom, and even that decision is implanted within us as a seed, and then he will build us into his church, and it will all feel like worship, not because we have to, but because we want to, because we're pregnant with faith, hope, and love. I'm not much of a reader, but I think that my favorite piece of literature is the myth of the Grand Inquisitor in Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazov. 
In the myth told by one character to another character, Jesus returns to earth during the Spanish Inquisition, and he hasn't changed. The way he does, you know, in American pop fiction and movies, he's just the same. He heals the sick, touches lepers, forgives sinners, loves the outcast, but he refuses to turn tricks. Refuses to do signs and wonders for the religious establishment. The Grand Inquisitor finds him, throws him in prison, and for 12 pages, just brilliant writing, this old priest rails at Jesus for having interfered with the work of the church. He rails at Jesus for increasing man's freedom rather than taking it away. He's angry with Jesus that, that Jesus doesn't say you have to, but dies in order that we would want to. He longs for the law when, quote, men are led like cattle, and he hates the presence of the Christ that draws people to himself like a lover. He sentences Jesus to burn at the stake, and then he yearns for a response, no matter how painful, no matter how terrifying, but Jesus refuses to say a word. He's the free will of God. He does what he wants to. He refuses to say a word. Instead, writes Dostoevsky, he suddenly goes over to the old man and kisses him gently on his old bloodless lips. And that is his only answer. The old man is startled and shudders. The corner of his lips seem to quiver slightly. He walks to the door, opens it, and says to him, Go now, and, and do not come back, ever. You must never, never, never come again. The prisoner leaves. And what of the old man, asks the li listener? The kiss glows in his heart. on the night that the great bridegroom was betrayed. By his bride, he took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same manner, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he says, he said, this cup is the covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. This is the kiss. This is the revelation of love. You know, a kiss isn't just lips, right? This isn't just bread and wine. It's the revelation of love. When you let him kiss you, you are submitting to the righteousness of God. And only then, because his word has already found a place in your heart and impregnated you with faith, hope, and love. And nothing is as powerful as faith, hope, and love, for they are the free will of God. And so, in the words of Paul, in this way will all Israel be saved. And in this way, all humanity, all Adam, will be made alive. You don't have to let him kiss you. And you don't have to go to heaven. But one day you will. Because nothing is more powerful than the kiss. And that's not a threat. That's a promise called the gospel. And so, Lord Jesus, I think we're saying um, we like you. And uh, thank you for, even though we complain about this quite a lot, I know I do, Thank you for freely choosing to be yourself. Amen. 
Hey, uh, if you'd like prayer, uh, I think Ted's going to be down front here. I'll pray with Ted anytime. In my sermon, I said Jesus doesn't turn tricks, and, and I meant that. He, he's not into that kind of thing. However, he does heal people. So we invite you to come forward and talk to him, pray to him. If you have a need or a Thanksgiving or whatever, you just need someone to talk to about the things on your heart um, because he's alive and he, he, he doesn't turn tricks, but he heals people. He raises the dead. He, uh, well, we'll talk about this next time in Romans, but every good thought you have, I think he whispers it into your heart. So we invite you to come forward for prayer. And then kind of in place of a benediction, I just want to say this. I want to say thank you. Or I want to say thank you to maybe Jesus in you. I think this a lot. I think it a lot. I seriously do. But I, and I don't find the opportunity to say it. But let me say it now. Thank you. And, and that's because I believe that you don't come to church because you have to because you think that by coming to church you'll save your butt from hell and get a ticket into heaven or by coming to church you'll get God to bless your business or make your children obey or or heal your back even though he might just do that he he likes to surprise us thank you that I believe you come to church because you like Jesus <laughs> And, you know, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You come to church because you like your creator. <laughs> because you make his day, Father's day. He makes you, and you make his day. So, maybe speaking for him, I can say on behalf of him, thank you. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen.